Hello and welcome to a video that I have been excited about making for absolutely ages, ever since Christie's in New York contacted me and asked me to be the tastemaker for their upcoming collector's sale. I am going to be taking you behind the scenes in the warehouse in New York, showing you how the amazing vignettes that they show for each of their sales are actually made. We're there on the set. I'll be showing you the incredible pieces that we got to choose from and why I picked the pieces that I did, the story that I was trying to tell with the vignettes and I'll also do a deep dive into one of the pieces, a piece so exceptional that it led me down a historical wormhole into the world of hot chocolate in the 18th century. And I hope you will follow me there where I will tell you more about Catherine the Great's love life and Louis XV's own recipe for hot chocolate. I had decided that the first vignette should be a bedroom vignette because Christie's had told me they would like me to make three or four vignettes and I didn't want them to be just disparate scenes. I wanted to create a little overarching story linking them all. So I decided to make an idealized version of a day in the life of a chatelaine. A chatelaine who has much more glamorous furniture than I do, let's be clear. And there are two things about life here that I really wanted to highlight. The first is that here in France, a lot of daily life is based around meals. So I thought that each of the vignettes should be a different meal during the day. And the other thing is that although a lot of people think that it must just be constantly all of us together chatting, having parties because there are so many of us living together, in fact, it's a mixture of total isolation and community life because quite a few of us are introverts and we need to be able to get away to our own rooms, our own spaces to recharge, find calm and inspiration. And I wanted this vignette to feel like one of the bedrooms at La Lande. We're so lucky here because we have beautiful French vintage wallpapers in most of the bedrooms that were already here when we bought. So I wanted that feel of color and pattern, but filled with antiques and a calming, restful retreat from the world. But I had one huge problem, which was that in the entire collector's sale, there was absolutely no bedroom furniture, nothing at all. So I had to use my imagination and find pieces that could evoke a bedroom without being made for bedrooms. Now I'll show you how we put the first vignette together and which individual pieces we chose from the collector's sale to use. The first fabric that I chose was called pagode. It was in the tradition of chinoiserie in France. There are pagodas, there are exotic animals. And the beauty of this fabric is that from a distance, it just gives a delicate, almost textural wash of color. But as you get closer, an intricate world of delight opens up to you. Here we have exotic pagodas and courtyards filled with tiny animals, a monkey and a bird that I like to think of as a peacock because it's flying over the fountain, which is exactly what our peacock likes to do at Lalande. So the minute I saw that pattern, I, I felt a strong connection with Lalande and I knew I wanted to use it. This is gonna look amazing. So now we need to get furniture in here. And turn this set into Chatelain's boudoir. So vignette number one is the Chatelaine's bedroom, which she's just returned to after global travels. Her trunk is still open in the corner. She's putting away her clothes and she's at her dressing table, planning the day ahead, what work needs to be done. And of course, what is she going to wear? We wanted to make a vignette that felt like a room that somebody may actually be living in, where they've gathered furniture, maybe from members of their family, or they've bought things over the years. Not everything's been bought in the same style at the same time. We have a lot of countries represented here and a lot of different centuries. This linen press is from the mid 19th century, it's English. We've dressed this linen press as a shoe cupboard, which just shows that you don't need to buy a linen press and use it for linen. Use it for whatever you need it for. I love the shoes in it, it's so pretty. I think it's prettier open than close like this, where you can see the beauty of it on one side, but then really pretty things inside on the other. We have a beautiful Louis Vuitton trunk, the top is jewelry storage. And then inside you have not only lovely drawers, there's shoe storage here. And then everything, because it would be traveling, can be strapped down so it doesn't move around. But I love this. I mean, 
I suppose if you're in a little train compartment, perhaps you haven't got a desk with you. Well, there you go, you have your desk as well. You can write letters home. I could play with this for absolutely ages. Just wonderful. So I wanted to show it to all of you. Philip loves it because it's got a P on the side. <laughs> yes. <laughs> PN New York, that just seems right. But if you thought that little desk was cool, come and have a look at this tiny table. This is French, it's very useful. You can put this in any little corner that you just need to add a bit of interest to. But look at this, this is so unexpected. It is a little writing desk. There you have space for your ink and your sand for blotting. You can put pencils, pens here, and you can store your paper in here. I think this is specifically for writing love letters, <laughs> clearly. This desk, which I love, if I could take something home, this would definitely be on the list. This is from the last quarter of the 18th century. It's Italian. It's made of fruit woods and exotic woods. It's very beautiful. And here again, obviously there's a lot of writing going on in days before TV. If you need a little bit more space for and your writing, this comes out. Without a laptop or no typewriter? Laptop. This is pretty useful for a laptop. I can have the whole breakfast going on in the background and still have my laptop open here. I won't pull it out completely because I don't want everything to fall off the table. The flowers, of course. Now, when you look around the room, you'll see that things are placed strangely because it's for the photo mm -hmm. and it often means so the chair is further off to the side than I would usually have it if I was sitting here but that's because we have to look at it from the camera side to make the vignette so it's actually much further forward this way than you would have it usually you would have everything closer to you but if you then come back the magic of photography this way it all evens out from a distance we also chose this beautiful silver pin cushion this is very leland we are constantly sewing repairing and i've not seen such a lovely lovely thing this is late 17th century this is english and this is the first iteration of chinoiserie that we see and you can see here that it's these beautiful um, engraved birds and kind of a fantastic scene. It's delicate. It's really, really delicate. And then once we get towards the mid 18th century, Rococo kind of gets mixed in with Chinoiserie, more like this mirror right behind you. Oh, what a mirror. Where you can see the difference where here, mm. on this pin cushion, the decoration is added to the form. A European which is a pretty form. Traditional yes. European form. By the time you get here, the decoration is overtaking the form. Yes. So it's really kind of a wonderful evolution of chinoiserie. And that's what I love about the wallpaper, which I, the fabric. They do this as a wallpaper, but we have the fabric here. It shows how this same decorative design that starts on the pincushion goes through this age is still being produced now. This is the modern version of this historical chinoiserie tradition and made with lovely contemporary bright cheerful colors which actually i suspect the 18th century would have been like but now we see everything faded and dimmed and so we're bringing back the color bringing back the cheerfulness i really like it mm -hmm. we have prints based on hudelte's botanical engravings french this belonged to Jane Reitzman, and that's very exciting for me because I so wanted to come here for the Reitzman sale, and I couldn't because of COVID, but I'm able to use one of her pieces of furniture. This lovely little canapé en corbe, Louis XV, French, and very importantly, leopard print footstool, Louis XV, and this belonged to Susie Guest, who was known for her use of leopard print in decorating. She had a home which was entirely carpeted in leopard print. I think it's absolutely Absolutely fabulous so I really wanted to get that in as well and whilst we're next to CZ Guest's footstool on here is a book written by CZ Guest Fast Garden an illustrated garden primer which sounds like the sort of thing I need because I am NOT a gardener and I would like to learn what to do this is a wonderful book and I'm definitely going to get hold of a copy of this for myself and read it I was really excited to see there was a Rothschild bird service from Heron because we actually have this at La Land. Well, only seven plates of it, but nevertheless, we eat on this quite often. And so this is a little bit of La Land here. Makes me feel very at home. One day, whilst at their Vienna residence, the Baroness lost her favorite pearl necklace and presumed it had been stolen. But several days later, the gardener found a few beautiful little birds 
playing with the necklace in a tree. This story was told to the Heron factory and they created 12 motifs of the birds in the trees. There's the necklaces. There they are again in this one. I just brought a couple out. And as I said, we have seven of these plates. It's an extremely popular service for her. And in fact, Princess Diana chose this pattern for her wedding reception when she married Prince Charles. Look at the lovely little jewels that oh, they've got there. Yeah. It, it's, oh, it's, it's just, I didn't know that story. That's really sweet. <laughs> it makes me happy whenever I look at them. Thinking of this grand party with a naughty magpie running off with someone's <laughs> prized diamonds. I feel a little bit like a naughty magpie. Yeah. <laughs> Always attracted to the sparkly stuff. That's what we've been doing all day here, just pulling things from everywhere. Mm -hmm. I definitely think at La Land we have the motto that you use the best stuff. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter if things are mismatching, it's just if it gives you joy, then bring it out and use it. Otherwise there's no point, it lives it's in the back point. of a cupboard. People care about their homes more because they've been confined to mm -hmm. them and they look around and realise, well, this isn't just a place where I wake up at seven o'clock, run out to work, come back in the evening, fall straight to sleep and mm -hmm. leave again. But it's somewhere that should be a haven and something that sparks imagination mm -hmm. and curiosity. Mm -hmm. I mean, bust of Zeus in Citrine, mm -hmm. which I might not have picked up. He's very, very tiny and you barely notice him, but how could I not choose something with this snail? Four little snails supporting I Zeus. I mean, a mighty god supported by four tiny snails. That had to go on the desk. That's amazing. Then, of course, we were lucky to be able to dress this as a bedroom, a boudoir, to find these lovely Sèvres pots, which I've just mixed in with some of my makeup. There's this amazing chocolatier. For me, the most exciting piece from this vignette and the one that I would have brought home with me if I could was definitely this chocolatière. It was commissioned as part of a huge dinner service by Queen Catherine the Great from the great French silversmith Jacques Rottier. In 1770, she contacted him asking for a silver dinner service for about 60 people. Now, he created 3,000 pieces, which were sent to her in several shipments. Over two years, his workshop had to work night and day to get it made, and over two tons of silver were used in its production. But the only part that really stays with me with all of this is, it was a 3,000 piece set for 60 people. There were over 500 plates. How many plates do you need for 60 people? It's made me realize that my dinner services in this chateau are way too small. I have not been thinking like Catherine the Great at all. She ordered this service for herself, but by the time it was delivered in 1772, she was coming to the end of her relationship with Count Orloff, and I suspect wanted to give him a very beautiful consolation gift as he left and you can't get a gift much more beautiful than this one. They had been together for about a decade, ever since he was her lover behind her husband, the Tsar's back. In fact, he helped to depose and possibly kill her husband for her, and they even had an illegitimate child, Alexei, together. But now, 10 years on, it was time for her to move on to new lovers and for Count Orloff to go with his lovely, lovely dinner service. But there is something that tells us that Queen Catherine the Great didn't just give him some old thing that she didn't particularly want herself. Because many years later, when he died, sadly mad by this stage of his life, she decided that she wanted that dinner service so badly that she bought it back from the people who'd inherited it from him. So the poor Empress ended up paying for it twice. Sadly, after her own death, many of the pieces were melted down, and this is something that Jill at Christie's told me regularly happened to silver in the past. Unlike furniture or porcelain, it could be melted down whenever fashions changed and remade in the new fashion, or it could be turned into ready cash if the family had run out. And that even happened at Versailles. The glorious Hall of Mirrors used to be furnished entirely with silver furniture but the wars were interminable in the reign of Louis XIV and eventually he melted all of the furniture down to fund the wars. This makes silver furniture very rare and if you're interested in it, there is this stunning tea table, it's German from the 19th century, for sale in this collector's sale. Of the surviving pieces of the Orloff service, several are in the world's greatest museums, like the Louvre, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, and there are probably only about 200 pieces remaining in private hands. This is 
one of them. This is an extraordinary opportunity to own such an important part of history. I just so wish I could buy it. Christie's have sold other pieces from this service before and they have reached heady prices. For example, in 2013, these four candlesticks were sold for over $600,000, but even that pales into insignificance next to the $900,000 made by these two silver wine coolers in 2002. But the piece de résistance was this tureen which sold at Christie's in Paris for, wait for it, 1.7 million, which really makes this chocolatier start to look like a little bit of a bargain. With its estimate of 15 to 20 thousand dollars, it is obviously much simpler in style than those magnificently worked tureens candlesticks. And that's very interestingly because it was a utilitarian piece. The chocolate pot would actually have been used by the staff to create the chocolate. It wouldn't just have been decanted into it and put on the table. The chocolate pots are a little bit less decorated than the other pieces from the service because they wouldn't have been brought out to the table. They would ah, have been used in the back oh. by, the, by the servants yes. to prepare the chocolate and then it would be poured into much fancier cups to bring out. The other pieces in the service, a lot more decorated the plates and things like yes. that that would have actually physically been on the table. Still stunning, heavy, high quality silver, but a little bit more subdued than the rest of the pieces in the service because it wasn't made as much to be seen by the whole dinner party. In a way it means that it would have been used more. Mm -hmm. If yes. this really was being used mm -hmm. by the staff to prepare the breakfast hot chocolates, then this would have seen a lot of action, which I love. The thought of all the hands yes. that have held exactly. this. Exactly. So this is for the, the stirring stick? Yes, you could. you got to keep it stirred up. And was um, that one of the ones that you do like this? That is how you yeah. would mm -hmm. And it doesn't necessarily mean that Catherine the Great herself or Count Orloff wouldn't have touched it because the love of hot chocolate was really a mania in the 18th century royal courts. It arrived at around the time of Louis XIII in France, but it was Louis XV who really ran with it. He loved it so much that he would prepare his own hot chocolate in his private apartments at Versailles. And in fact, the recipe that he would probably have used still remains today. It was published in a book from 1755 by Menon called The Dinners of the Court. So if you want to try the same hot chocolate as Louis XV, this is what you have to do. Place an equal number of bars of chocolate and cups of water into a cafetiere and boil it on a low heat until the chocolate has melted. When you're ready to serve it, add one egg yolk per four cups of hot chocolate and continue to stir it over a low heat without allowing it to boil. And apparently it is better if prepared a day in advance. If any of you want to try that for yourselves, and I'm definitely going to be trying it, sadly not with that chocolatier, I will put the recipe in the description box below and you can look it up yourselves. It's on the Chateau de Versailles website. It's hard for us to imagine how elitist chocolate was back then because now it's a pleasure that all of us can afford to enjoy. It was considered rather a powerful aphrodisiac and Madame de Pompadour drank several cups a day just to try and keep up with the much more elevated libido of her lover, Louis XV. Marie Antoinette, who incidentally arrived in France the same year that Catherine the Great ordered this chocolatier for herself, had her very own chocolate maker called Le Chocolatier de la Reine. And the poor queen chose it as her last meal. Just before going to the guillotine, she had a cup of hot chocolate with a small cake. They were her last pleasures on this earth. I loved every second of making this vignette at Christie's. They were such fun to work with and we had the most fantastic day. And I can't wait to show you in the next videos the other vignettes that we made in depth and some of the glorious, glorious pieces that I was able to use. It was such a dream and I'll see you next time. <laughs>